So we're going to go into a word study. Mark and I, for about mm, more than a month, I think, we've been talking about how Jesus would talk in the third person. So we're going to prove that today. He wouldn't say I very often. He would say things like the Son of God or the Son of Man. As we showed last week, he didn't come to the earth to promote himself. He didn't come to glorify himself. He came to glorify his Father. That's his character right there. That's what we're looking at. So we decided to do a word study, Son of Man. So first of all, we'll go to the Old Testament. Now, most of them are interesting, but uh, Mark saw one right away in Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19, because it's the first place in the Bible where this concept of Son of Man shows up. But can I just show you what this Son of Man actually means in the Hebrew? So it really just means the son of Adam, because the Hebrew word for man is Adam. Yeah. It has other meanings too, like it means a man in the sense of he's ruddy, he's red, because, you know, he was made from clay, he's made into flesh, and God breathed into him the breath of life. So we are the children of Adam. Now, there's several references throughout the Old Testament. I really like going through the book of Ezekiel because it shows up the most often. The reason I'm going to look at Ezekiel, this will help us understand why Jesus is saying that he is the Son of Man. Because Ezekiel is a man. And all the way through the book, he said to me, Son of Man, Stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. God and the angels, when you're sent as an angel, you are representing the person that sends you. You can actually negotiate with the one sent from God as if you were talking to God himself. Because then we can apply that to Christ as well. He's a man. He calls himself the son of man. But because he's sent from God, representing God. When you deal with Christ as the Son of Man, because he's sent from God, in a way you're actually negotiating with God himself. When Abraham came into the Promised Land, his nephew, Lot, and Lot went to the area where Sodom and Gomorrah was, God was really ticked off at Sodom and Gomorrah because they were awful people. They were raping tourists. Anybody that visited town, they would go after them. And it's obvious because later on, when the angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah, they wanted to do the same thing to the angels. God had sent the angels to Abraham. Now get this. As Abraham and the angels negotiate how many righteous people need to be in the city, they came and sat down and had a meal with Abraham. And God had said the reason he was sending these messengers, he said, I shouldn't do what I'm going to do without talking to Abraham first. As Abraham hears this story that Sodom and Gomorrah are going to, they're going to be destroyed. So Abraham began, begins to negotiate with the three angels representing God. If there's 50, can we stay off the destruction? And the angel said, yep. As he's negotiating with the angels, they actually have the authority for the final verdict in this negotiation. As if God himself was negotiating. So he negotiates the angels down, 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 and finally they get to 10. If there's 10 righteous, that's a small number of righteous people. And the angels said, yep, yeah, if there's 10, we won't destroy the city. My point is, 
that these angels, because they're sent from God, represent God fully. They're actually speaking for God. Now, Jesus, being the Son of Man, sent from God, represents God without being God. That's my point. You see, the three angels that negotiated with Abraham weren't God, but they represented God fully. They came in his name. Sure. Okay? Now, the same thing we're going to see in Christ. He said constantly, I did not come to promote myself. Everything that I do, I do because my Father showed me. Now, because... Jesus is sent from God. It's like dealing with God himself. Now, later on, when Jesus appoints apostles, same idea. They are sent ones. Ambassadors. Speaking on behalf of Jesus himself. I give you the authority. Yeah. I'm sending you. Yeah. You represent me. Everything you do, do in my name. You have the authority to do so. I give you the authority. And that authority that Jesus gave the disciples was given to, was given by God to Jesus. Exactly. The reason the prophets were called son of man is because God has always spoken through men. Now, this is just a pattern you'd have to see. Just look through the scriptures. Has God done anything on the earth independent of speaking through a man? See, the judgment on the earth, the flood. He spoke to Noah, build the ark. The ark becomes the message. Then the Bible says God waited for Noah. Why? Because Noah is now in charge of the timing of everything. Yeah, sure. Like Lori had said, God isn't coming down there getting after Noah. Come on, Noah, hurry up. We have a schedule. No, there is no schedule. No. Noah, when you finish the ark, that's when the judgment's coming. It's all up to you. You finish the ark. The ark is not only the message to the rest of the world. The ark is your deliverance from judgment. So the same with Christ. When he calls himself the son of man, he never comes out and says, I am God. Or he doesn't come out and say, I am Christ. He'll say it in the third person. So that's why Ezekiel and Daniel are the two main prophets that are called son of man. Because they're men speaking on the behalf of God himself. That's what prophets do. The first place this shows up in Matthew 8, 20. This is when some of the disciples of John the Baptist came seeking Jesus. And they said, can we go with you and stay at your place. And Jesus answered them, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Mm -hmm. Why is he always speaking about himself in the third person? I find this fascinating. He says, but the Son of Man. Why? This is his purpose. He's a man sent by God. He's not exalting himself. Then the next one, Matthew 9, 6. But that you may know that the Son of Man, see again, third person, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. His point was, there's no difference. When it comes to healing, there's no difference. I can either say your sins be forgiven or take up your bed and walk. That's so simple. It's because he was given authority by his father. Exactly. 
Now, they'll argue and say, see, 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 no one can forgive sins but God himself. Now, I'll ask you, is that true? No. Oh, no. Why? Because he tells us to forgive one another. Yes. He told us, whoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Yep. And they might even get angry and say, that's not the same word as forgive. Oh, it means the same thing. The Son of Man has power to forgive sins, and especially in his capacity, because he is a representative of his Father. Yeah. Yeah. He has power, authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, something that I've been thinking about for years is the concept of, okay, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. He's a man, representing God. Then he sends the Holy Spirit to be upon all believers, that they too would be like prophets, declaring the gospel, declaring the truth, and doing things that the prophets did in the Old Testament. That means challenging false concepts among the people of God. That's what prophets did, right? And uh, addressing leaders for leading the people of God astray. See, that's also prophetic. So I see a pattern. Jesus came as a man because God always spoke through men. You got Noah, Moses, Abraham. He accomplished his plan through men. They're men. Sent with a message. We too, because we're followers of Christ, are sent with a message. I'm saying it this way because we're sent with a message, but too many Christians water down the message. Oh no, they don't even have the message. It's already watered down when they get it. <laughs> it's not a prophetic message like the prophets. See, the whole idea of the believer's the Spirit of God coming upon all the believers, in Joel chapter 2, that my sons and daughters will prophesy. In other words, the same Spirit that was on the prophets is now upon the believers. But we are doing what God told his believers to do. That is, proclaim the gospel with a bit of a prophetic edge, because we're, we're not just proclaiming something good, like nice good, like appealing good. No, we're bringing a sword. Right? All you have to do is go back into the book of Isaiah, and it says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those that bring good news. Whoa, stop, wait a minute. You have to think about what Isaiah's doing. He's calling it good news. But Isaiah is rebuking the leaders and the people of God because of their false gods. And he's telling them we need to bring down these high places. Yes. Which, by the way, Isaiah had told many kings that. But it was finally Hezekiah that got the message. He tore down all those altars. Now, that good news is not, not always the message you want to hear. But Hezekiah heard that message, didn't he? It wasn't good news for the other kings. But was it good news for Hezekiah and the people under his rule? We have to redefine the gospel. We're sent to preach the gospel. All that we know about God through Jesus Christ. Clarifying his character. Clarifying and challenging people when they have a false concept of God. When their God is not like Christ. When their God is unchrist like That's when the high places are coming down. Yeah, you're tearing down those strongholds. Yeah. Now, to them, it's not good news. No, oh no. 
But to those that receive it, it is good news. For me, this has all been brewing for years about this concept of the Son of Man. Only recently, though, have I understood that Jesus talked about himself in the third person constantly. And the reason I understand it is because whenever I talk about our videos, I want to say our videos. Because I have a confession to make. I watch and listen to those videos, each one, about 20 to 30 times each. What are you doing watching yourself? <laughs> yeah. I'm not watching myself. I'm listening to the concepts. Which open up even more concepts. I'm listening to the word of God. Like I told Mark that things came together last time around when I mentioned that Abraham believed the promise. And that was the word he had. Previous to that, even though that was in my heart, I had never made that connection. We've put the word of God in our heart. Yeah, yeah. And God honors that. And the Holy Spirit comes along and goes click, click. Yeah. Yeah. And you go, oh... Oh my goodness. Yeah. Faith. Abraham, the father of faith, believed the word that God told him. Wow. And it's so easy to see now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You feel like slapping yourself. Yeah. Why didn't you see it before? You always had it there. But the Holy Spirit, while I'm actually teaching, goes click click let's move along let's go to Matthew chapter 16 I'm going to start in verse 13 the reason I'm picking this is because we've heard this a bunch of times but all of a sudden there's details popping out at us Matthew 16 verse 13 when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, Mark, do you know how many times I've quoted this? And I said to myself, and when I'm teaching others, Who do men say that I am? I stand corrected. Because Jesus said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? See that? It's in the third person. Then he finally goes into the first person. In verse 15, he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Yeah. Now that that's significant because he's with his disciples. He can be himself for a second. But... As we keep reading, I'm going to show you, he's going to, that won't last long. But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I also want you to notice, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He doesn't say, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. Then Jesus said, good, Peter, that's good. You got that from heaven, not from men. He says, I will build my church upon this revelation. Now watch this, verse 20. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Oh, whoa. Why would he do that? Because he came as a servant not to be exalted by himself or by men because he came to represent his father and glorify his father, not himself. Even though his job was to be Christ, he was not going to elevate his job. Did, did he not say that to the Samaritan woman? Yeah, I'm going to go there. Let's go there. 
So we're going to go to John 4, right? Is that the chapter? I believe. Yep, Jesus and the woman of Samaria. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And because his disciples had went to the city to buy some food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew, watch this again, the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It's third person all the way through. Jesus is not on the earth to exalt himself, to declare his deity, as John MacArthur said. That is not his job. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I, who speak to you, am he. See? It's awkward. Because he could have said it simpler than that. He could have said, it's me. He's not going to answer this question. It's me. The person speaking to you, am he. <laughs> I think I'll end it there. <laughs>